Good evening. Good evening from the heart of the Adirondack Mountains, where once again we've been waking up to snow every morning, where I could only rake just a little bit of my yard around my snow piles, and where we just have this dream, this dream of maybe some tree and flower buds. That's where we live, the Adirondacks. I'm Skip Holtz, the assistant pastor at Long Lake Wesleyan Church and Adirondack Bible Fellowship in Newcomb. And both are located right in the heart of the Adirondacks. You can reach me at my email, holtzhouse at frontiernet.net, or senior pastor John Goki at longlakepastor at live.com. We are both here to serve you. I notice there have been a lot of listeners outside of our area who might not even know much or where the Adirondack Mountains are in New York. Well, let me quickly share the uniqueness of where we live and how important it is for the gospel message to be heard. The Adirondack Mountains is a state park. But what people don't realize about our park is it is over 6 million acres. It is larger than the states of Vermont, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Connecticut, Delaware, and Rhode Island. Yes, one park, one area. 137,000 people call this park their year-round home. That's a lot of people until you realize this. Again, that New Jersey is smaller than our park, and yet New Jersey has 8.8 .8 million people. By the way, that 137,000 people isn't really many more people than we used to have back in the late 1800s. In the 21st century, we live our lives here a life is really, I guess, an enigma. You talk about social distancing, and that's our lives here. We literally live in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by more animals than people. We drive miles and miles to just make the simplest of purchases, the most basic of healthcare needs, let alone movies and malls, and forget about deliveries. Why live here then? Well, besides the Lord calling me this, this more than any other place where I have lived, which has been a lot of places, is my home. So what does that have to do with my message? It doesn't have to do with my specific message, but it does have to do with our beginnings of Saturday night message, our Sunday morning messages, our weekly encouragements. Pastor John has been sharing during this pandemic, and we will continue to share because we recognize that in such isolation, that the true, that the same is true for spiritual isolation. Churches in, churches in the Adirondacks are not just decreasing, they are closing. I'm thankful for the pastors who either work outside the church or pastor more than one church just to keep their doors open. We might live in social isolation, but Pastor John and I refuse to allow this spiritual isolation. Hence, it is truly our heart and desire to reach the Adirondacks for the Lord. You know, if you had asked me two months ago, what does Jesus mean by his command, go into all the world and preach the gospel? I would have talked about our world and how important it is for us to go and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in the world in which God had placed us. I would have gone on to share about the world and the need that we have to share um, through prayer and through finances with those missionaries that are going around the world. But you know, this pandemic has caused us to realize something, that God is allowing us to go into all the world with technology, allow us to reach the world. So as I begin my messages uh, that Pastor John and I will be going back and forth on, but I felt like, you know, here's a clean slate. I've been asking, Lord, what do you want me to share? And and so I love to preach topically, and, and, uh, and there's so many neat topics we could be sharing about. I also like expository preaching, but after praying and seeking the Lord, I uh, decided that I wanted to, the Lord was allowing me to just to share my favorite book of the Bible. It's the book of James. James is probably the most practical pastor, and he has the most practical messages for us. And honestly, I guess that's kind of me. I'm a simple meat and potato, simple, practical preacher of the word. So tonight we are going to do that. 
I've taken a lot of time to talk about the Adirondacks, so we're not going to get through too much tonight. This isn't going to be a long message, but I am going to begin with James 1, 1. Well, actually, let me say this. I'm going to start with just the first word, James, James. As we begin our study on James, it's important for you to know who James is. Many of you know that James was the brother of Jesus, and that's my belief. Um, and I base that upon many verses, but Matthew 13, 55, isn't this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother Mary and not his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? But there are some denominations that want to interpret brother as cousin. Well, they want us to believe that, that these were not his brothers, but that they were strictly Jesus's cousins. And, and honestly, there's nothing in, in scripture that supports that at all, but it's based upon a, a thought that Jesus and Mary could not have had a typical marriage relationship. And, I, and I'm actually a little offended by that because honestly, of course, Jesus would have been grown up in a typical relationship, typical home, mom and dad, physical relationships, having other kids. And so I believe that James was what it says in scriptures, that James was the brother of Jesus. We know this about James too, that not even James or his brothers believed in Jesus while he was alive and, and walking and ministering on earth. John 7, 5. For even his brothers, that's Jesus's brothers, did not believe in him. But this is where it gets so neat. I love the fact that something happened when Jesus came back. You know, we just recently celebrated Easter. And one of the things you might not realize, well, when Jesus r rose from the dead, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, it says this. Then he, it's talking about Jesus, appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Jesus came first and specifically to his brother James after the resurrection. I don't know about you, but that gives me goosebumps to realize that Jesus had that kind of love relationship with his brother, that he, in, the, in, in all the busyness, that he came back and he specifically came to see James. Why? I think it's obvious. He was wooing James. He wanted James to come and to know him. And he came to purposely let James know that he was loved and, and that, that he had a special, special place in James for James in the kingdom of God. You know, the part that I think really hit my heart as I was studying the book of James was realizing, you know, it's not just James. But Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, has done so much to prepare our hearts to receive him. If the truth be known, all my life, the Lord was wooing me into a place of surrender and salvation. And the Holy Spirit, the Lord, was wooing you to bring you to that place of salvation as well. For me, I accepted the Lord on my 18th birthday. Well, actually, it was the day after my birthday on March 5th, 1973. But my walk but the wooing in my life began many, many months and years before. In fact, you know, years after, as a, years after I was a pastor, I received a document. This document was written by my grandmother. It was probably written back in the late 50s or early 60s. And she stated that my family had had 300 years of pastors. It made me realize at that time how much and how hard the Holy Spirit had worked in my life, wooing me, bringing me to a place of surrender to him. Before I was saved, Dale, who is my wife now of 45 years, would almost share daily with me about the Lord. Finally, she broke up with me. Yeah, she broke up with me because she saw something that was so real. I was playing a game. I was playing a game with her. And I was playing a game with God. I wasn't interested in God. I was only interested in her. 
So she broke up with me, and on my ride home that night, I remember as clearly as it was yesterday, it was rainy, it was not a good night out, it was in October, and I was driving away from King's College in Briarcliff Manor, some of you might know where that is, and as I was driving away, it was down a hill, and I prayed. I prayed a prayer. I prayed a prayer for the first time in my entire life. And my prayer was something like this. God, if you are a God, and by the way, that would have been in my heart a lower G. If you are a God, well, I'm not going to give her up. You can kill me, but I will not give her up. Thing is, at that very moment, I lost control of my car. I did a 180 in the road and almost had a very serious crash against a big concrete barrier. But you know what? In hindsight, I realize now, God was trying to get my attention. He was wooing me. He wanted me to surrender and have a relationship with him. Lord, uh, Friends, I could go on, and, and the many times and many ways the Lord worked in my heart and worked in my life. I can promise you this. This evening, as Jesus worked to get the attention of James, Jesus worked to get the attention of Skip Holtz, and Jesus worked just as hard to get the attention of all of you listening tonight. Jesus worked well before we realized he was even there. So here's, I want to take a moment and just to talk about those who might not know the Lord. You're listening for one reason or another. I want you to know something. You might not recognize it, but there's a lot of wooing that's been going on in your life. The Lord has been working hard and over time to get you to that place of surrender. Jeremiah 1.5 says this, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. You know... You don't realize this, but before you were even born, there was a working in your heart and life bringing you to the place where you are now, wondering, what do I do? And the answer is simply this, surrender. He simply, the Holy Spirit wants us to have a simple understanding. And the understanding is found in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, thinking back to my younger days at 18, when Sister Dale would share with me about the Lord, I had no problem understanding I was a sinner. That much I knew. I had no problem believing that I had fallen way short of what God would have for me. But also in the beginning of Romans 6.23, it said that the wages of sin is death. I had no trouble believing that either. I knew that I was a sinner and I knew that I deserved just hell, death, and the grave. I had no problem. I believed that. I understood that. I accepted that. You know what I had trouble believing? I had trouble believing the rest of Romans 6.23. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. You see, my problem was I couldn't understand how anybody, let alone God, the creator of all the heavens and the earth, how God could ever love me and how God could ever forgive me. You see, I came to that understanding that the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. You see, I want us to understand that James, a brother of Jesus, when Jesus came back and Jesus spoke to him, James understood the love not only that his brother Jesus had, but God the Father had and accepted and surrendered to what the Lord had for his life. The other part of this, James, that brother of Jesus, not only got saved, but boy, he got busy. He got busy for the Lord. He became pastor of one of the biggest churches of the time, the Jerusalem church, and he was busy for the Lord until he was brutally murdered for his faith. It's a great example. You know, God's desire is for us to be saved, but God's desire is not only for us to be saved and just to sit in churches, or in this case, in our, in our living rooms, but God desires us to be saved and to be found busy for him. The greatest 
promise for me in the Bible is this, Matthew 25, 21. Well done, good and faithful servant. Salvation is essential, but busyness is important. My prayer is tonight that you and I will both be found busy for the Lord. If you're not saved, get saved. Surrender to the Lord. Realize that this gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And if you are saved, then let's get busy. But James goes on. I've only been through one word, so we're going to go on. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. A servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is the part that, that caused a smile on my face. So you have James. He's writing a letter, but it's actually going to be more than a letter. We know it's going to end up being a book in the Bible and the importance of James. But he's writing at the time a letter. But, but more than that, it is a practical application of our Christianity. It's taking a look at it. And we're going to talk about who that letter is to and all of those things uh, next week. But just we realize tonight that James, that practical book, is written for us how to be a better Christian. And I'm reading it, and this is the way he starts. James, a servant of God. You know, not for nothing. I'm not, not much of a brander or anything like that. I don't have any, any professional experience. But you know what? If I was writing something of such importance, maybe I would have started off something like this. James, the brother of Jesus, the son of Mary and Joseph, the pastor of the world-famous Jerusalem church, pastor and minister to thousands. Now, that's impressive. But it wasn't his heart. I don't think James was really into needing to impress people. He started his letter the way he saw himself. He saw himself as a servant. So maybe it's a good time for reflection. Let's take a moment. Describe yourself in one word. What would that be? Athlete? Scholar, singer, business person, entrepreneur, lately maybe loner. I think we all could maybe one word to describe our life would be loneliness, a loner, uh, because of the times in which we live. Me? I don't know. Maybe um, teacher, worker. I hope it's faithful. You know, those are are just single words, but, but you know, it, 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 it describes who we are. Uh, James, of all the things he could have used to describe himself, he says, servant. You know, it's said that we are what we eat, and I hope, I truly, truly hope that that is not true. Because if that is the case, I am ice cream and Diet Mountain Dew. And, and I hope that the day comes when I go to be with the Lord, I hope my my gravestone doesn't say, here lies Skip Holtz, partaker of ice cream and diet Mountain Dew. I'm hoping for more than that in my life. But honestly, think about it. We are kind of what we do. And I don't mean Mountain Dew, kind of what we D-O. We are also what is most important to us. And we are what we spend the most time doing. The Bible says we are of what is valued to us. We are where our heart is. That's what it means in Matthew 6, 21. For it says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Servant. Yeah. Servant says a lot about James. A servant does the bidding of the master. A servant puts the needs of the master before their own. A servant spends little time on themselves, but mostly spends their time on the master. James, he was a servant because he did the bidding of the Lord. James put the Lord before himself, even church unto death. James spent little time on himself. So tonight, 
You know, we have seen this. As Jesus loved James and appeared to James, so please, please, please know this. Please know this. Jesus loves us. And Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, whether you have accepted the Lord or not, he has been wooing you into a relationship with him. And if you've made that commitment to him, I praise God for that. Now get busy, get busy for the Lord. But if you haven't made that commitment yet, he has been wooing you and he's made it so easy. It's easy because he did the lifting, he did the work, he paid the price. That's what we just were recognizing over the last couple of weeks that Jesus was arrested, he was found guilty, he was beaten, he was brutalized, he was thrown on that cross and he died for us and he came back to life to continue his ministry to us. He did the work and it's easy for us. I call it the Romans 10-9 prayer. All we need to do, friends, is declare with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. And it says in Romans 10, 9, that then we shall be saved. It is just from the confession of our mouth and the belief in our heart who Jesus is and accepting of that in our heart and life. And it says, then we are saved. So tonight, my prayer is that you, maybe you've heard the gospel been preached all your life, but recognize tonight in this time of unknown. You know, Pastor John and I were talking earlier, and, you know, I think there were a lot of people who said, you know what, I have a lot of years to worry about my spiritual life. But we've come to realize in this pandemic, nothing is promised. Not today and certainly not tomorrow. So if you've heard this message before, knowing you've heard it before because the Holy Spirit has been wooing you in your heart, the Holy Spirit wants you to surrender to the Lord. And he's made it so easy for you because all you need to do is if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then it says that you're saved. It's surrendering. It's believing, it's confessing, and that's my prayer is that you will do that tonight. And, you know, we also learned from James that he thought of himself simply as a servant. He could have said so many other things to describe himself, but, you know, he thought most important was to let everybody know that he was a servant of his brother, a servant of his brother and a servant of God. And he spent his life doing the Lord's business. How am I described? How do others describe me? And what is important in my life? Let's pray tonight. Lord, these are two very powerful questions. Both kind of have to do with our eternity. One, where we spend it, and the other one, how we live it. Lord, my prayer is tonight that if there be one, just one, just one, just one who would say, yeah, pastor, I'm one of those. Man, I, I've known it. I've heard it all my life. I just have never responded to it because, you know, there's always tomorrow. But tonight, you've realized that there might not be a tomorrow. And we know, Holy Spirit, that you have been wooing these people, wooing these people, getting them to a place of surrender to you. You've paid the price. Jesus, you died on the cross that we might have life and have life more abundant, life more eternal. So my prayer is that if there be one out there tonight, they will pray the prayer of Romans 10, 9, that they will confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in our, their hearts that God has raised them from the dead. For Lord, it says, if we confess and we believe that we are saved. And my prayer is, Lord, continue to work in their hearts and lives. Lord, get them to that place of surrender, that, that place of the prayer of Romans 10, 9. And Lord, I also pray for those who have looked at James tonight one who could have said so much about themselves, and, and yet James said simply, a servant. 
a servant of my brother and a servant of God. And Lord, I pray that, that whatever time, whether, whether you call us home through the rapture or you call us home sooner, Lord, I pray tonight that we will be found busy for you. For Lord, the words that we want to hear as believers is well done, good and faithful servant. And that's not an automatic thing. It's done through busyness. We need to be servants. We need to serve our master. So, Lord, I pray, even in this pandemic, that we will find ways to be busy for you. We thank you tonight, Lord, for the opportunity to share the word with those who might not have know you as Lord and Savior, and to share the word tonight with those who, who do know you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, my prayer is just continue to minister to us in this time of pandemic, this time in our homes, this time of isolation, this time of loneliness. Lord, I pray that the words that we bring forth from these, these two churches in Long Lake and Newcomb will continue to minister to many, many, many hundreds of people. And Lord, encourage us, Holy Spirit, at this time, in your wonderful name, the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for tuning in uh, tonight, and I pray you'll tune in tomorrow at 11 o'clock for our next service and, and just be edified and lifted up as the Holy Spirit ministers to us through the word again. God bless you.